Hi everyone, it's Ms. Lopez. This is the video where I walk you through properties of water um, for unit one, basically chapter two of your textbook. So here are the key concepts we're gonna be going over um, in this PowerPoint. We're gonna be looking at the atomic structure. We're gonna be looking at how atoms interact to form molecules. Um, and then we're gonna go into the different macromolecules. But this video today is gonna focus just on 2.1 and 2.2, where we look at um, a, a brief overview on the structure of atoms and then use that to help us understand the properties of water. So here is a basic diagram of a very generic diagram of um, an atom. So all matter, um, whether it's living or non-living, so biotic or abiotic from your ninth grade terms, um, is composed of matter and matter is made of atoms. And what you'll see in this picture here is that they've got in the center area, the nucleus. So this right here is your nucleus. And inside the nucleus are two types of particles. You have protons, which are positive. And you can see the positive charge right here in these red areas. And then you have some other particles that are neutral. They have no charge whatsoever. And those are called neutrons. No charge. The last particle um, that makes up matter are called electrons. And electrons are very, very small and they're negatively charged. So you can see right here, there's one electron, here's another, and the electrons orbit around the nucleus, and you'll learn uh, more about that in chemistry classes, about the shapes of those orbitals and how many electrons go into each level. Um, but most of what we focus in on when we're talking about biology is these electrons and how those electrons behave. Um, something to keep in mind that when we're doing um, um, chemistry, you have to understand that like charges repel and that different charges attract. So if you have, uh, it's kind of like you use with magnets, where if you have a magnet with a positive pole and you have another magnet with a positive pole, uh, these two, you will feel them pushing away from each other. So they, they don't attract each other, they push away. But if you have the negative and the, and the positive end come together, they will stick together. Um, most atoms are gonna be neutral because the number of electrons equals the number of protons. So let's just take a random example. Let's say that an atom has plus six charge in its nucleus. So it's got six protons, totaling positive six, but it has six electrons orbiting around the outside and each electron has a negative charge, what you would see is that this mathematically comes out to zero. If an atom um, has an uneven number of protons or electrons, um, then this isn't going to be zero. For example, um, let's take this same one, it has positive six, and now let's say it's lost an electron. Now it only has five electrons, next charge on something like this would be positive one. Most atoms though are neutral because that equal that there's that balancing of the equal number of protons and electrons but we're going to see how poles or these charges can be created when those electrons are not evenly shared. So an element is a pure substance that only contains what kind of atom? And for living things, the, one, the ones we're gonna focus in on are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, with carbon being the most important one. Organic matter is matter that is made of carbon. Um, and it's carbon in some kind of bound form, usually it's with carbon dioxide or hydrogen or any of these other ones, but most living things. Uh, we're going to have this, these six base, basic ones and then all the other ones that are included like magnesium, calcium, those will be present in, in depending on the living organism in different concentrations. So the number of protons identifies the element. Think of it like a unique fingerprint that makes you different 
from all other people. Uh, the number of protons identifies each element as, as, as similar to a fingerprint. So if it's six, it's always going to be considered carbon. Um, if it's eight, it will always be considered hydrogen, uh, oxygen, sorry. And the number of protons is called its atomic number. And then again, for that neutrality, in other words, so that it comes out to zero, the number of protons is gonna equal the number of neutrons. And then when it comes to mass number, that is the total number of protons and neutrons that are found in the nucleus. Although we're not gonna talk about that too much other than when we do carbon dating. Other than that, we really don't focus on mass number in biology. The key thing about those subatomic particles, the protons, the electrons, the neutrons, is that it's the behavior of the electrons that determines whether a chemical bond will form and what shape that bond will have. So we focus in mainly on the electrons, specifically on those outer electrons, which are called valence electrons. So atoms with unfilled outer shell tend to undergo chemical reactions to fill the outer shells. Um, and so in chemistry, you're gonna learn about something called the octet rule. Um, and this can, the sharing of electrons can, um, will help the atom become stable. And anytime you have atoms that are bonded together um, by sharing those electrons, it, they are called molecules. So, Again, it's, it's not just any electrons, it's what's called your valence electrons. These are the outer electrons in the, the shell model. Um, those are the ones that are gonna interact to try to fill that octet rule. Um, and then once they do, the, 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 the big idea here is it's those electrons that are interacting and when they interact, they form bonds um, to form those molecules. A chemical bond is an attractive force that links atoms together to form those molecules. And there are several different types of chemical bonds. We are gonna be going over specific examples of them. So typically you learn about ionic bonds and then covalent bonds. These are two different types, um, but we are going to go in and focus on specific types of ionic bonds or covalent bonds, just depending on the type of molecule that's being built. Um, carbon, carbon will always have four electrons in its outer shell. So whenever we draw carbon, you will see it drawn like this with four different spaces. So space number one, two, three, four, and usually molecules will fill those spaces. Um, but there's something unique about carbon. Carbon is, um, is, is not entirely completely unique, but it is able to, this is something that's, that's uh, helpful to carbon, um, is that they can form multiple bonds. So what you're seeing here is that this carbon and hydrogen, that line right there represents a single covalent bond. So covalent bonds are pretty strong. It take, you have to put energy or have to use energy to break them. Um, and we'll talk about more, we'll talk about energy more when we do um, biochemistry in unit three. But what you'll see here is that there's a sharing of one pair of electrons and we draw that with a single line. So that means that between the carbon and the hydrogen, there's a, there are electrons being shared. Carbon can also form a double bond. And so what we do is we draw it like this. So you'll see that there's two lines indicating that these two are sharing two pairs of electrons. And then some molecules, including carbon, um, can form triple bonds. And so you'll see here, there's three lines in between representing the three pairs of electrons that are being shared. Um, the degree of sharing is not always equal. So what that means is that there is some electronegativity, the force that an, atom, that a nucleus exerts on electrons. And so, there is a, there's a whole way to figure out what is highly electronegative and what isn't. But the key thing that I want you guys to get from this or to, to remember for biology is that oxygen. Oxygen is an electronegative hog. It is going to take those electrons more than some other substances. So we're going to put here hogs. Well, not hogs. Let's... um. What's a good, um, takes electrons 
more than other elements when it's being shared, when they're sharing those electron, electrons. Okay, and we're gonna see this in the properties of water. We're gonna see how that oxygen, even though it's supposed to share, like we saw over here, there's sharing going on right here between here. We're gonna see how oxygen will, when it's paired with something like hydrogen, it's going to take, it's not gonna share even Steven, it's going to take those electrons just a little bit more. Okay, so if the two atoms have similar electronegativity, they share the bond equally, meaning that no one um, is going to take the electrons more than another, and that's just called a nonpolar covalent bond. But if the atoms have different electronegativities, the electron tends to be near the most attractive atom, and that's called a polar covalent bond. Um, and so what you're seeing here are two different models of the same molecule, that's a water molecule. I know it's water because it's got uh, two H's and an O. And what you're seeing here is the electrons that are being shared between them. Now what's happening is the electrons tend to hang out more with the oxygen and the result of that uneven sharing are slight charges. And that's what this symbol is right here. It just means a slight charge. So your oxygen is slightly negative and the hydrogen is slightly positive because it's the electrons are being shared, but it's not being shared equally. And so what happens because of those slight charges is the formation of hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds are attractions between the slightly negative end of one molecule and the slightly positive end of the hydrogen molecule result, and that's what that hydrogen bond is. So these will definitely form between water molecules as we saw with the properties of water, and they're important in the structure of DNA and proteins. So water molecules will form hydrogen bonds with each other, and this is what contributes to some of its unique properties. Unique properties such as high heat capacity. So what happens is, is as you input energy, to try to heat up the water, instead of making the molecules move faster, what's happening is that energy is breaking the hydrogen bonds which are not true bonds. They're just like attractions. Like we saw with the magnet example, that's what hydrogen bonds are. They're not true bonds, they're just attractions. And so as you put in energy, instead of heating up the liquid, that energy is being used to break the hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. So the, mole so the water resists temperature change. Um, and that is what is meant by that heat capacity. It's how much energy is needed to change the temperature of the substance and water has a very high heat capacity. It takes a lot of energy because not only are you trying to get those water molecules to move, before you do that, you've got to break those hydrogen bonds in between each of them. So a lot of water is required to raise the temperature, a lot of heat is required to, to raise the temperature of water. That heat is instead breaking those hydrogen bonds and the presence of water in living organisms will help prevent extreme um, uh, environmental fluctuations. Um, water has a high heat of vaporization, so it's very similar to your heat capacity, except your heat of vaporization is, is the energy required to go from a liquid to a gas. Um, and so sweating is a great example of how those, those water molecules, as they're leaving your body, as they're being converted from a liquid to a gas, they're taking that heat with them, and so that's how sweating cools you down. Water bonds also give, uh, hydrogen bonds also give water the cohesive strength or what we call cohesion. Water molecules um, resist, they tend to be, they're, they're, because of those attractions, they hold on. Um, and then it also, this cohesion, in addition to adhesion, will help print, um, water move up water columns, like in the xylem of plants, from the roots to the leaves. Any polar molecule that can interact, um, that can interact with any other polar molecule through hydrogen bonds. And so if something is able to interact with water, we call it hydrophilic, which means water loving. Um, and then something that doesn't interact with water is called hydrophobic, so water hating. 
Um, and so what you see here are two examples of how these interactions occur. So water, here's the water molecule, has that negative and those positive ends. And so you'll see here how this negative end is attracted to the positive of this other molecule. And this positive is attracted to the negative of this other water molecule. So this is be something that's hydrophilic and can dissolve or interact with water. Something that's hydrophobic has no charge. And so you see that the water molecules, they're not going and they're not going and attaching to these non-charged molecules. Um, instead, you only see that when, it, when there's hydrophilic molecules. And so that's why we call water a versatile solvent, not universal, because in this instance, water is not interacting with that molecule. I hope this video was helpful to you guys. Um, the next part that we're going to talk about are functional groups, um, and we'll do more detailed notes on that in the next video on your notes for carbohydrates. Thank you guys so much for watching. Bye.